What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Southern Sorcery. Today we are looking at Miram, the Sentinel Worm. She is a dragon spirit. Quickly before we get into it, I just want to show you guys. Miram is the number three commander over the last two years, falling just behind her dragon by about 2,000 decks. Miram has 19,990 as of recording this, and her dragon has 22,000. Not far behind. You guys apparently really love your dragons. Let's cover the second most popular dragon and the third most popular commander over the last two years. So Miram, Sentinel worm is a 6-6 six, six legendary creature she is a dragon spirit she costs three generic a green a blue and a red and then has flying and ward two which means you have to pay two generic mana extra if you are casting a spell or an ability that targets her so to target that creature you have to pay two generic mana and then says whenever another non-token dragon enters the battlefield under your control create a token that's a copy of it except the token isn't legendary if that dragon is legendary so she gets around the legendary rule letting you make multiple copies of legendary dragons so this is pretty wild she's extremely powerful i built this deck in preparation for this deck tech and it has been a blast to test drive so buckle up and let's get into it. First up today, we are going to take this in a different direction. Instead of just going through creatures, sorceries, instants, we're going to break it down a little bit differently. First, we're going to talk about other dragons in this deck. And there's a whole bunch of them. Why would you run anything else other than dragons in this deck? There are a handful that aren't, but we'll get to that. First, we have Ancient Bronze Dragon. This is an Elder Dragon. It is five green green. It's a seven seven with flying, and it says whenever Ancient Bronze Dragon deals combat damage to a player, roll a d20. When you do, put X plus one plus one counters on each of up to two target creatures where X is the result. So if you roll a 10, you put 10 plus one plus one counters on two creatures. Next, we have Ancient Copper Dragon. It is four red red for a six five flying. Whenever Ancient Copper Dragon deals combat damage to a player, roll a d20, you create a number of treasure tokens equal to the result. So crazy amounts of mana. And then Ancient Silver Dragon. It is six blue blue for an eight eight. Elder Dragon has flying and says whenever Ancient Silver Dragon deals combat damage to a player, roll a d20. You draw cards equal to the result. You have no maximum hand size for the rest of the game. So these Ancient Dragons are insane. They all have super powerful effects and they are all great. Next we have Atsushi, the Blazing Sky. It is two red red for a 4-4 dragon spirit that has flying and trample. When Atsushi, the Blazing Sky dies, choose one, and you can choose exile the top two cards of your library until the end of your next turn, you may play those cards. And the second option is to create three treasure tokens. So both good death triggers. Next we have Balefire Dragon. It is five red red for a 6-6 six, six dragon has flying whenever it deals combat damage to a player it deals that much damage to each creature that player controls so up to obviously it is a 6-6 six, six, uh, doesn't have trample or anything so the damage has to get through to the player but when it gets through it basically wipes the other person's board next we have cavern horde dragon this is a new dragon from lord of the rings it is seven and two red for a 6-6 dragon that says this spell costs X less to cast, where X is the greatest number of artifacts an opponent controls. So you're almost certainly never going to pay that full 9. You could pay potentially as little as 2 for this dragon. It has flying, trample, and haste, so you can attack as soon as it comes out. And it says whenever Cavern Horde dragon deals combat damage to a player, create a token for each artifact that player controls. So again, if you had the full discount, you're playing against an artifacts deck and they have a buttload of artifacts out, you're going to make a buttload of treasure. Next we have Dragonborn Champion. This is two, a red and a green for a dragon warrior. It has trample and it says whenever a source you control deals five or more damage to a player, draw a card. If you have a whole lot of dragons out potentially you could draw several cards next we have earthquake dragon this costs 14 generic and one green which is insane however this spell costs x less to cast where x is the total mana value of dragons you control 
It has flying and trample, and then you can pay two generic and a green, sacrifice a land, and return Earthquake Dragon from your graveyard to your hand. So a little bit of recursion, a way to get it back. If it dies, it is a 10-10 elemental dragon. This thing is huge. Next, we have Goldspan Dragon. It is three red red for a dragon that is a 4-4 with flying and haste. And it says whenever Goldspan Dragon attacks or becomes the target of a spell, create a treasure token. And then the most important part, it says treasures you control have tap sacrifice this artifact add two mana of any one color so a normal treasure just taps sacks for one this allows you to tap sack your treasures for two so very good next we have hellkite tyrant it is four red red for a dragon it is a six five with flying and trample it says whenever it deals combat damage to a player gain control of all artifacts that player controls at the beginning of your upkeep, if you control 20 or more artifacts, you win the game. Mind you, treasures count as artifacts, so if you've made some treasures, you get through with this, steal someone's entire board's worth of artifacts, untap with 20, you win the game. So, an interesting alt-win con here. Next, we have Kega, the Tide Star. It is a dragon spirit for five and a blue for a five five with flying. And it says when this creature dies, gain control of target creature. So when this dies, you can steal someone else's creature. Next, we have Clouth, Unrivaled Ancient. It is five red green. It has flying and haste for a four four dragon. It says whenever it attacks, add X mana in any combination of colors where X is the total power of attacking creatures. Spend this mana only to cast spells and until the end of turn, you don't lose this mana as steps and phases in. So that sets you up really well for your second main phase, especially if you've got all these draw triggers and things happening and uh, during your combat, you'll also have a whole bunch of mana and then you potentially be able to cast some of those things that you just drew. Next, we have Corlesa Scale Singer, a dragon bard. It is one green, one blue for a one four. And it says you may look at the top card of your library anytime and you may cast spells from the top of your library. So it just gives you a little bit of card advantage. Next, we have Lathless Dragon Queen. This is four red red for a legendary creature dragon. It is a six six with flying and says whenever another non-token dragon enters the battlefield under your control, create a five five red dragon creature token with flying. So she populates your board with five five flying dragons and then you can pay one in a red and it says dragons you control get plus one plus O oh until end of turn. So going into combat, if you've got extra mana floating around, you can pay that as many times as you like to buff up your board as much as you like. Next, we have Niv Mizzet Perun. It is three blue and three red for a five, five dragon. And it says this spell cannot be countered. It has flying and it says whenever you draw a card, Niv Mizzet Perun deals one damage to any target. And then it also says whenever a player casts an instant or sorcery spell, you draw a card. So some card advantage and ways to ping your opponents. Next we have Niv Mizzet the Firemind. It is two, two blue and two red for a total of six for a four four dragon with flying. It says whenever you draw a card, Niv Mizzet the Firemind deals one damage to any target and then you can tap it to draw a card. So another Niv Mizzet with a little bit of the same um, kind of redundancy. However, you don't draw cards off of the instance and sorceries, you can just tap this dragon to draw a card. So not quite as good, but still good. Next we have maybe the MVP in this deck. It is Old Gnawbone. It is five green green for a legendary dragon. That is a seven seven with flying and says whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, create that many treasure tokens. So now every creature you attack with, anytime any of them deal combat damage to a player, you make that many treasures. Great card, lots and lots of ramp. Next we have Scourge of the Throne. It is four red red for a dragon that is a five five with flying and dethrone. Uh, dethrone is a mechanic that says whenever this creature attacks the player with the most life or tied for the most life, put a plus one plus one counter on it. So it has a way to grow itself. 
And then it says whenever it attacks for the first time each turn, if it's attacking the player with the most life or tied for the most life, untap all attacking creatures. After this phase, there is an additional combat phase. So this is crazy. It lets you do double combats. Next up, we have Thrakus the Butcher. It is three, a red, a green for a three, four dragon peasant with trample. It says whenever Thrakus the Butcher attacks, double the power of each dragon you control until the end of turn. So this is a huge boost. And then last dragon we have is Udvara Hellkite. And it is a 6-6 six, six dragon for 6 and 2 red. And it has flying. It says whenever a dragon you control attacks, create a 6-6 six, six red dragon creature token with flying. So another way to populate your board with even more dragons. Now let's take a look at non-dragon creatures. There's only a handful. First up, we have Adrix and Nev Twin Casters. It has Ward 2. It is 2, a green and a blue. It's a merfolk wizard, and it says if one or more tokens would be created under your control, twice that many tokens are created instead. So we're going to double up Miram's triggers to make even more dragons. Next, we've got Anger. It's three and a red, and it has haste. It's a 2-2. Two -two. It says as long as Anger is in your graveyard and you control a mountain, creatures you control have haste. So we really want to find a way to get this into our graveyard as quickly as we can that way our dragons all come in with haste next we have dragon lord's servant this is one in a red for a one three goblin shaman that says dragon spells you cast cost one less to cast so we've got a cost reduction there next we have dragon master outcast it's a human shaman at one one it says at the beginning of your upkeep if you control six or more lands create a five five dragon creature token with flying so populating our board a little bit more Next, we have Goblin Anarchomancer. It's one red, one green for a 2-2 goblin, and it says each spell you cast that's red or green costs one less to cast, so more cost reduction. Next, we've got Roaming Throne. This is a golem. It is four for a 4-4, four, four. has ward two, so again, same thing as our commander. It costs two to target this. It says, when it enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. So we'll obviously choose dragon. So it's a pseudo dragon. And then says, Roaming Throne is the chosen type in addition to its other types. And this is the part we really love. If a triggered ability of another creature you control of the chosen type triggers, it triggers an additional time. So now all of our dragon triggers are going to trigger twice, including Miram making more tokens. Next we have Sarkhan, Soul of Flame. It is a human shaman, one blue red for a two four. It says dragon spells you cast cost one less to cast. So more reduction. And then it says whenever a dragon enters the battlefield under your control, you may have Sarkhan, Soul of Flame become a copy of it until the end of turn, except its name is Sarkhan, Soul of Flame and it's legendary in addition to its other types. All right, now we're going to move on to our sorceries. First, we have Balagad Recovery. Uh, this is a great card because it can return cards from your graveyard to your hand, but then if you need it to, it can enter as a land. So in the early game, if you are missing a land drop, you can cast this for its land side, and later in the game gives you Recursion. Next, we have Besmirch, one red red for a sorcery, and says until end of turn, gain control of target creature. It gains haste, untap, and goad that creature. So this is a way to take that thing that's causing you problems and use it against the person. Next, we have Blasphemous Act. This is a board wipe. It costs one less to cast for each creature on the battlefield, and it deals 13 damage to each creature. So you potentially can cast this for one red. This is here as a failsafe. Now we have Farseek, it's one and a green. Search your library for a plains, island, swamp, or mountain card and put it onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle your library. So we've got some ramp. We also have Nature's Lore, which does very similar. It is one and a green. Search your library for a forest card, put that onto the battlefield, then shuffle. We also have Jessica's Will. It is two and a red and it says choose one. If you control a commander when you cast this, choose both. So the first is add a red for each card in target opponent's hand, and then the second is exile the top three cards of your library. You can play them this turn. So just a way to onboard a little bit of red mana for when you need it. Next we have raise the palisades. This is a new card from Lord of the Rings. It says choose a creature type, return all creatures that aren't of the chosen type to their owner's hands. 
So a one-sided board wipe in most cases as you're going to choose dragons. Next we've got Rishkar's Expertise. It is four and two green. It says draw cards equal to the greatest power among creatures you control. Most of these dragons are big. We have ways to make them bigger. You can wait until after a combat phase with Thrakus out and everything's power is doubled. Then you cast this and you can draw a whole bunch of cards. And then on top of that, you can cast a spell with mana value five or less from your hand without paying its mana cost. So you're gonna pay six to cast this, draw hopefully a whole bunch of cards, and then cast something mana value five or less for free. So at the end of the day, net is this is going to cost you one green mana total once you've cast the spell for free. Next we've got instance. First we're gonna have a little bit of counter magic here with arcane denial. It is one in a blue to counter a target spell. Its controller may draw up to two cards at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep. You draw a card at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep. So you'll draw one card off of this as well. It's strictly better than counter spell. Next we've got some removal with Beast Within. It is two and a green. Tar destroy target permanent. Its controller creates a 3-3 beast creature token. Next we've got Chaos Warp. It is two and a red for an instant. It says the owner of target permanent shuffles it into their library, then reveals it, then reveals the top card of their library. If it's a permanent card, they put it onto the battlefield. So it is a little risky. You're gonna go after something someone controls. They are gonna they're gonna shuffle it into their library, and then they're going to reveal the top and put it out if it's a permanent. <clears throat> so it is possible to make things worse with this or for them to get the exact same thing right back out. But nine times out of ten, or maybe better, that's not going to happen. Next we have deflecting SWAT. It's two in a red, or if you control your commander, it is free, and it says you may choose new targets for target spell or ability. This is nice because you can use it to counter something, you can use it to counter an ability, you can use it to counter a target of something you control and turn it right back around on them or target something that can't be targeted and then it just falls off. Next we've got Heroic Intervention, one in a green, it turns your entire board hexproof and indestructible until the end of turn. Next we have Kindred Summons, it is five green green for an instant and it says choose a creature type will obviously choose dragons and it says reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal x creatures where x is the number of creatures you control of that type put those cards onto the battlefield then shuffle the rest of the revealed cards into your library so if you have six dragons cast this you'll go get the next six dragons off the top of your deck and then you'll put those straight onto the battlefield at no additional cost and then you'll shuffle everything else that wasn't dragons back into your deck this can be a huge turn if you cast this spell. Next, we have another spot removal. It is Pongify. It costs one blue. It says destroy target creature. It can't be regenerated. That creature's controller puts a 3-3 green ape creature token into play. So a little bit of spot removal there. All right, next we're going to move into our artifacts. So first, we're going to have artifacts that are ramp. That is going to be Arcane Signet Dragon's Horde, which is unique to dragons. Whenever a dragon enters a battlefield under your control, put a gold counter on Dragon's Horde. And then you can tap it, remove a gold counter from Dragon Horde, draw a card. Or you can tap it and add one mana of any color. So versatile there for you. We also have Mind Stone, taps for a colorless. We also have Orb of Dragonkind. You pay one colorless into it, tap it, and add two mana in any combination of colors, but you can only spend it to cast dragons or activate abilities of dragons. Then you can pay a red and tap it, sacrifice the Orb of Dragonkind, look at the top seven cards of your library, you may reveal a dragon card from among them and put it into your hand, put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So it's there for you in a pinch. Next we have Soul Ring, taps for two colorless, and then we have the Great Hinge. It is seven green green, and it says it costs X less to cast, where X is the greatest power among creatures you control. More often than not, you're gonna cost this for two or three total mana. Then it says add two green when you tap it and gain two life, and says whenever a non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one plus one counter on it and draw a card. This card just does work in every deck it's in. So those are our ramp. Next we have some artifacts that were not ramp. First we have 
Chamil, the inner sun. It is six generic and says spells you control cannot be countered. That's amazing. All of our stuff can't be countered. So good. And then it ain't done yet. It also says at the beginning of your end step, discover five. And discover is a new mechanic from Lost Caverns of Ixalan. And it's essentially Cascade. But it says exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a non-land card with mana value five or less. Cast it without paying its mana cost or put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom in a random order. So it's any spell five or less. You can cast it for free or if it's a sorcery and instant that you don't want to cast in that moment, you put it into your hand and then put the rest on the bottom in a random order this thing's wild then we have herald's horn it is three generic and it says when it enters the battlefield choose a creature type so we'll choose dragons creature spells of the chosen type cost one less to cast so more reduction and then at the beginning of your upkeep look at the top card of your library if it's a creature card of the chosen type you may reveal it and put it into your hand so cost reduction and card advantage next we have lightning greaves it is two for an equipment it says equipped creature has haste and shroud with a zero equip cost this is to protect our commander as she is the driving force and the scariest card in this deck. So we have some protection for her. We also have Panharmonicon for four generic. If an artifact or creature entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. So it doubles up on ETB triggers, which Miram has that. So we'll make extra dragons with Panharmonicon out. We also have Swiftfoot Boots. This is similar to Lightning Greaves. It is two and gives the creature Hexproof and Haste, but has an equip cost of one, whereas Greaves has a zero equip cost. Next, we have Urza's Incubator. When it enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Creature spells of the chosen type cost two generic less to cast. So more cost reduction for our dragons. That rounds out our artifacts next up we have our enchantments for this deck we have 10 of those first up is a new card from lost caverns of ixalan it is descendants path it is two and a green and it says at the beginning of your upkeep reveal the top card of your library if it's a creature card that shares a creature type with a creature type you control you may cast it without paying its mana cost if you don't cast it put it on the bottom of your library. Next, we have Doubling Season. It's four and a green. It says if an effect would put one or more tokens onto the battlefield under your control, it puts twice as many of those tokens onto the battlefield instead. If an effect would place one or more counters on a target permanent you control, it places twice that many of those counters on a permanent instead. So it doubles up our tokens and doubles up our counters. Next, we have Dragon Tempest, one and a red. It says whenever a creature with flying enters the battlefield under your control, it gains haste until the end of turn. Whenever a dragon enters the battlefield under your control, it deals X damage to target creature or player where X is the number of dragons you control. So both of those are great. A lot of our dragons have flying, so they'll get haste. And then anytime a dragon enters the battlefield, it deals X damage. And we should potentially have lots and lots of dragons out, so we should be able to dole out tons of damage. Next, we have Kindred Discovery. It is three blue blue and says, as Kindred Discovery enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Dragons. Whenever a creature you control of the chosen type enters the battlefield or attacks, draw a card. So now every dragon we cast is a cantrip and replaces itself in your hand. And then when we attack, even more cards go into our hand. So a great spell for this deck. Next, we have Parallel Lives. It is three and a green, and it says, if an effect would create one or more tokens under your control, it creates twice that many tokens instead. So this is the token half of a doubling season. Next up, we have Ristic Study. It is two and a blue. Whenever an opponent casts a spell, you can draw a card unless that opponent pays one. Great staple. Next, we have Rhythm of the Wild. One, a red and a green, and it says non- Creature spells you control can't be countered. So another way for us to keep our creature spells uncounterable. And then it says non-token creatures you control have riot. And riot is a keyword that says 
they enter the battlefield with your choice of either haste or a plus one plus one counter. So most of the time we'll probably be choosing haste, but we do have several other ways to give our dragons haste or they may enter with haste on their own and then we can choose to give them the plus one plus one counter. So another great card. Next we have Shadow in the Warp. It is one red and a green. This comes to us from the Warhammer 40k precons. It says the first creature spell you cast each turn costs two generic less to cast. So more cost reduction. Then it says whenever an opponent casts their first non-creature spell each turn, Shadow in the Warp deals two damage to that player. So good card there. Next we have Teamer Ascendancy. Teamer is a word that means green, blue, and red all together as a color identity. This enchantment says creatures you control have haste. Whenever a creature with power four or greater enters the battlefield under your control, you may draw a card. So more card draw. Finally, we have Up the Beanstalk. It is a new enchantment from Wilds of Eldraine. It is one in a green, and it says whenever Up the Beanstalk enters the battlefield, and whenever you cast a spell with mana value five or greater, draw a card. So another great card draw spell. Lastly, we have one Planeswalker in this deck. It is Sarkhan the Masterless. This is a Planeswalker that costs three generic and two red, enters the battlefield with five loyalty counters on it, and it has a static ability that says when a creature attacks you or a Planeswalker you control, each dragon you control deals one damage to that creature. So a great way to incentivize people to not attack you, and if they do, there will be penalties. He also has two abilities. There's a plus one ability and it says until the end of turn, each planeswalker you control becomes a 4-4 red dragon creature and gains flying. So it turns itself into a 4-4 dragon. Or you can minus three and create a 4-4 dragon creature token with flying. So just another way to populate even more dragons. All right, finally we are moving on to our land base for this deck. It has 34 lands. 35 if you include the MDFC, which is the Balagad recovery that we talked about in our sorcery. Um, first up, we have Breeding Pool. It is a shock land, taps for green or blue. Next, we have Cavern of Souls. When it enters, choose a creature type. You can add a mana of any color to cast spells of that creature type, and they can't be countered. Next we have Cinder Glade. It enters the battlefield tapped unless you control two or more basic lands. Taps for green or for red. Next we have Command Tower. Taps for anything we need it to in our deck. Next we have Crucible of the Spirit Dragon. And it adds colorless to our mana pool. Or you can pay one, tap it, put a storage counter on Crucible of the Spirit Dragon. And then finally it's third ability. It says tap it, remove X storage counters from Crucible of the Spirit Dragon, add X mana in any color combination, spend this mana only to cast dragon spells or activate dragon abilities. So this actually is kind of cool. If you don't need it, you don't need to tap it, you can pay into it and then store that mana for a later time. Next we have Dream Root Cascade. It enters the battlefield tapped unless you control two or more other lands. It taps for green and or blue. Next we have Exotic Orchard. Add one mana of any color that a land an opponent controls could produce. Then we've got Haven of the Spirit Dragon. It's similar to the Crucible of the Spirit Dragon. Taps for colorless. Tap add one mana of any color. Spend this mana to cast dragon creature spells or you can pay two and tap it. Sacrifice it. Return a target dragon creature or Ugin Planeswalker card from your graveyard to your hand. So in the late game, if you've got plenty of mana, then you can sacrifice this and bring back a dragon that you would rather have. Next we have Hinterland Harbor. It enters a battlefield tapped unless you control a forest or an island and it taps for blue or for green. Then we have Kessig Wolf Run. It taps for colorless or you can pay X, a red and a green into it, tap it, Target creature gets plus X, plus zero, and gains trample until the end of turn. So you just need to get a little buff and punch some damage through to finish somebody off. Next we have Moss Warp Bridge. It enters the battlefield tapped, and it has Hideaway 4. Hideaway 4 means when it enters the battlefield, look at the top four cards of your library, exile one of them face down, and then the rest go onto the bottom of your library in a random order. It taps for a green, 
or you can pay a green into it, tap it, and you can play the exiled card without paying its mana cost if creatures you control have power 10 or greater. So you can find something in those top four, put it under there, play it for free later. Next we have Rejuvenating Springs. It enters a battlefield tapped unless you have two or more opponents. Taps for a green or a blue. Next we have Rockfall Veil. It enters the battlefield tapped unless you control two or more other lands. Taps for red or green. Next we have Rogue's Passage, which taps for a colorless, or you can pay four into it and give one of your creatures unblockable for the turn. Next we have Rootbound Crag. It enters the battlefield tapped unless you control a mountain or a forest, and it taps for red or green. Then we have Secluded Courtyard. It enters the battlefield choose a creature type. It taps for colorless, or you can tap it for one mana of any color. Spend this mana only to cast creature spells of the chosen type or to activate an ability of a creature source of the chosen type. Next we have Spine Rock Knoll. It enters the tapped and it also has Hideaway. When this land enters the battlefield, look at the top four cards of your library, exile one of them face down and put the rest onto the bottom in any order. And then you can pay a red into it, tap it, and you can play the exiled card without paying its mana cost if an opponent was dealt seven or more damage this turn. Next we have Spire Garden. It enters the battlefield tapped unless you have two or more opponents. It taps for red or green. Then we have Steam Vents. It enters the battlefield tapped unless you pay two life. Taps for blue or red. Then we have Stomping Grounds. Same thing, enters the battlefield tapped unless you pay two life. It taps for red or for green. Next we have Storm Carved Coast. It enters the battlefield tapped unless you control two or more other lands. Then we have Sulphur Falls, which enters tapped unless you control an island or a mountain. Next we have Temple of the Dragon Queen. It enters the battlefield, you can reveal a dragon from your hand, and it enters tapped unless you revealed a dragon this way, or you control a dragon. As it enters the battlefield, choose a color, and then Temple of the Dragon Queen will tap for one mana of the chosen color. So it will stay the same the whole game, but you can choose it when it enters the battlefield what color you want it to be. Next we have Temple of the False God, taps for two colorless. Activate only if you control five or more lands. Then we have Training Center. Enters the battlefield tapped unless you have two or more opponents. Adds blue or red. Then finally we have Unclaimed Territory. Enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Taps for colorless or tap for one mana of any color. Spend mana to cast a creature spell of the chosen type. So that rounds us out and finishes up our deck. Miram is a crazy good commander. And the best part about it is Ur-Dragon is an astronomically expensive card. Miram is five bucks, two bucks, somewhere in that neighborhood, depending on where you buy her at. So you can build a competitive dragon's deck for much, much, much cheaper. A lot of these dragons are interchangeable. So if you're on a budget, Miram is a great way to go. But even without budget concerns, this is a super fun deck. It's a play let me know what you guys think let me know what you'd take out let me know what you would put in we thank you again so much for spending some time with us here at southern sorcery if you don't mind please like this video and subscribe to our channel it costs you nothing helps us out a great deal we would appreciate it so so much we're also on all the socials you can check those out here and here then you can come and see what else we've got going on we also have patreon if you really want to support us and help us out further um, we do tons of giveaways on this channel and the only way we're able to continue keep giving stuff away is with our patrons. And we thank our patrons. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We are your humble servants. Thanks again so much for spending time with us here at Southern Sorcery. Have a great day, and we'll see you later. Bye!